the the next panel, Morris Manning, David Sagais, and Jeff Galway, is going to talk about number of division of powers topics. You may think that that is a relic of bygone days. I don't think it is. I think, to tell you quite honestly, I think these are the most interesting cases that there are. I think they raise the most difficult questions of policy. I think they are the most difficult and interesting cases to litigate. And I think the fellows who are going to talk about it now are some of the best in the business at it. I'd like to introduce the chair of the panel, Jeff Galway. Jeff and I were partners for many years at Blake Castles and Graydon. Uh, we worked on many constitutional cases together, a number of division of powers cases together. Uh, Jeff has uh, litigated at all levels of court, really litigated at all levels of court, uh, up to including the Supreme Court of Canada and before many administrative tribunals, the National Transportation Agency, the Competition Tribunal, the Securities Commission, and so on. He's spoken and written frequently uh, on this subject, uh, and he is very good at it. Jeff? Thank you. Well, as Neil said, the next topic is division of powers. And I think we're quite fortunate this morning to have two well-known and two, two well-published speakers to address this issue. First, my uh, far right is Morris Manning, who will be known to most of the people in the room. And he will address the recent case law concerning the scope of Parliament's jurisdiction over criminal law. And I'll say more about Morris in a few minutes when he gets up to speak. But first, I'd like to call on David Sagais. David is currently Senior General Counsel in the Civil Litigation Branch in the Department of Justice in Ottawa. The focus of David's practice over the past 25 years has been in the areas of constitutional and administrative law, civil liability of the Crown, and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. David was educated at the University of Manitoba and has been called to the bar at both Manitoba and Ontario. He joined the Department of Justice as a civil litigator in 1976 and served as the head of the civil litigation branch of the Toronto Regional Office from 1987 to 1990. David is a prolific writer, and as many of you will know, he is one of the co-authors of the leading text on federal court practice. As I indicated to you, I think we're very fortunate to have David. I've been against David in a number of cases. He's always articulate, he's always a gentleman, and always very thoughtful. I think we will, and what we have here this morning, I think is a very thoughtful paper on the constitutional protection for civil, civil remedies. David. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, the Department of Justice, this is performance evaluation season, and I will give you the <laughs> Deputy Minister's telephone number. We'll he doesn't believe belly. any of that. <laughs> I have to admit that when some of my colleagues asked what I was going to be speaking on, and I said, well, the question is whether access to the civil courts is constitutionally guaranteed, their eyes glazed over and they wavered a bit. They wondered, what sort of a topic is that? And I have to admit that its relevance may not be immediately obvious, or people may approach it on the basis that the answer is immediately obvious, an, an affirmative answer. It is a slightly esoteric topic because it is rare for parliament or the legislators <coughs> to completely exclude judicial remedies. It does happen. At least there was an attempt five years ago with respect to the Pearson Airport contracts, the privatization, where the federal government introduced a bill to allow those contracts to be breached and to prevent any remedy. 
a subject on which Professor Monaghan uh, both testified and wrote at the time. And it is an issue as to the scope of the legislature's ability to limit access to the courts, which does have a policy, public policy element. And one can think of cases such as the residential schools, such as tainted blood, from a public policy standpoint, and wonder whether the courts are the best place for those cases. Now, there may be means to find alternative dispute resolution by agreement. But one of the public policy tools which could be available to parliament, to legislatures, in mass tort cases, in cases which are not susceptible of effective and efficient uh, remedy in the courts, is to exclude the courts and to substitute some other remedy uh, or some other process. So it is not purely academic. And where the issue is coming up a bit, and I'm not suggesting there's an awful lot of activity in this area, but there is some, is in the area not of a complete exclusion of a judicial remedy, but challenges to legislation which seek to control the court process by eliminating the availability of some evidence or possibly by according immunity to some of the actors. And those provisions are subject to some attack as invalidly limiting access to the courts. Now let me say at the outset that my subject is a bit of a cheat, given that this is a division of powers panel. It starts in the division of powers, but it goes on from there. I think it legitimately starts in the division of powers, and I will also suggest as we go along that it is to some degree infected with a division of powers approach. And when I say infected, I say the division of powers, at least in my limited law school understanding of it, has been essentially an all or nothing approach. Either the legislature has the legislative competence or not. And the courts repeatedly stated the value of the legislation, the social policy, does not enter into the balance. There is no balance. It's in or it's out. And one of the things which is, seems to be suggested in the challenges, at least, which are being brought to exclusions or limitations on uh, access to the courts is that it is also an all or nothing uh, situation, that it is not attenuated in any way, that either there is an absolute right to get into the court which, with which the legislature cannot interfere, or the legislature can do pretty well what it wants. So I will start in the division of powers, which is the easy part, and then move on to uh, section 96 and to the rule of law. Let me pass quickly by what we, we know for sure, or what we know for sure as much as that's possible in a, in a system where the law can change uh, any given Thursday when the Supreme Court hands down judgments. The first thing we know for sure is that access to the courts to challenge the validity of legislation on division of powers grounds is secure. The provincial superior courts, the, such as the uh, Superior Court of Justice in Ontario, cannot suffer a removal of their jurisdiction to determine the constitutional validity of federal or provincial legislation. That has been established for some time and is most clearly uh, stated in the Law Society of British Columbia case 18 years ago, uh, where a purported transfer of that jurisdiction uh, to the federal court was read down. So to uh, avoid any limitation on the uh, jurisdiction of the provincial superior courts. 
Access to the courts is also guaranteed to obtain redress against unconstitutional legislation. And that's established in the Air Canada and British Columbia case where a British Columbia statute, taxing statute, was accepted to be invalid. Air Canada said, well, I'd like, we'd like our money back. British Columbia said, no, uh, we're keeping it and we're not uh, giving you the right to sue. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada uh, applying a fairly conventional doctrine by that stage uh, in effect created a remedy by forcing the Attorney General to uh, grant a fiat and allow the action to proceed. What we also know fairly securely is that access to challenge legislation is available in charter cases, and it goes further in charter cases to include access to challenge government action secured by Section 24. Paul Cavaluzzo spoke about this yesterday. I won't uh, belabor it, but to mention one case. And it goes to my theme as to the question of to what degree there is any balancing when looking at access to the courts. And the case is Preet, I'm not sure that that's the correct uh, pronunciation, but with a name like Sagaius, I get away with it. <laughs> Preet versus Ontario, which was a uh, malicious prosecution claim invoking uh, Section 7, arguing that there had been a violation of Section 7 rights. It was met uh, by defenses based on the Public Authorities Protection Act six-month limitation period and by the provision in the Provincial Proceedings Against the Crown Act which uh, uh, provides immunity uh, from actions uh, based on the exercise of responsibilities of a judicial nature. The Ontario Court of Appeal found that both those provisions were inoperative to prevent a Section 24 of the Charter remedy. That the province could not declare itself immune, nor could it limit by the temporal limitation period its liability. Now, I would observe two things about this. First is with respect to the limitation of the time limitation, the court went on to say, well, the province can't by legislation impose a six-month limitation period. The court could deal with this by matter of latches. So the court is saying the legislature can't do it, but we can. And the more important point probably is what the court is saying, not only can't the legislature do it, but it can't be justified. There is no suggestion in that case that there is any basis upon which to justify, for example, the six-month limitation period or the immunity. And can the right of access to a remedy under Section 24 be interfered with and be justified under Section 1? I would suggest that it should be able to be controlled in that way. But I'm suggesting that from a public policy uh, viewpoint, that these sorts of rights should be subject to a balancing. Let me move uh, past the Charter to good old Section 96. I must admit that I thought Section 96 was a subject solely for law schools. Uh, and maybe a few people went to the Supreme Court of Canada on occasion. <laughs> and Section 96 had developed a fairly understandable, at least relatively in constitutional law, understandable content to the effect that it limits the powers of the legislature to um, confer jurisdiction on a provincially appointed tribunal, limits the powers of the federal parliament to impose powers on a provincially appointed tribunal, 
and limits the degree to which the judicial review jurisdiction of the provincial superior court uh, could be ousted, possibly on that last one. The first two propositions usually result, usually were given effect by way of an application of the, the test in the, from residential tenancies in 1981, which looked back into the time of confederation, looked at the function of the courts. I won't go into all that. But in 1995, Chief Justice Lemaire added something to the analysis. And that's in Macmillan, Blodell, and Simpson. Now that's a case I must admit that I totally missed for five years. Well, four and a half at least. In that case, the Young Offenders Act provided that the exclusive jurisdiction to punish a young offender for contempt of court out of the courtroom would reside in the provincial youth court. The individual in McMullen, Blodell, and Simpson was a young person participating in a demonstration. An injunction had been issued by the British Columbia Supreme Court. Uh, uh, proceedings in contempt were brought. And the question arose, did this pass, this assignment of jurisdiction to the youth court, exclusive jurisdiction passed section 96. And it passed section 96 on the residential tenancies test in terms of looking back at confederation, the function, and the other steps. But what it didn't pass was an additional test articulated by Chief Justice Lemaire that there is a core jurisdiction of the provincial superior courts which cannot be removed. And included within that core jurisdiction, which is not defined in any substantive way, but included is the power to cite for contempt, punish for contempt, give effective orders. It was a five to four decision. Madam Justice McLaughlin, writing for the minority, found the residential tenancies test to be quite satisfactory and no additional requirement, no limit on ousting jurisdiction to be necessary. It's a five to four decision and if we're counting heads, we did a bit of that yesterday. Of the five in the majority, four judges are gone. One remains. Of the four in the minority, they're all still sitting. The other indicator is two months after Macmillan Blodell, in another residential tenancies case, this one arising from Nova Scotia, two sets of reasons were delivered. The majority reasons, once again, if I recall correctly, by Madam Justice McLaughlin, applying the residential tenancies test to a residential tenancies case, not a, not a difficult problem there, saying nothing about the core jurisdiction test which had been adopted by the court in McMillan Blodell. The Chief Justice, writing concurring reasons, found it necessary, having passed the legislation on residential tenancies, to go through the core jurisdiction analysis. I think this leaves McMillan Blodell in a slightly questionable position, certainly with an invitation to other litigants to challenge it should the opportunity arise. This is not purely a academic subject dealing only with uh, rent boards and the like, because this core analysis have been, has, there have been attempts to use it recently, and I'll just mention those briefly. One arose in a case called Babcock in the British Columbia Supreme Court, where the argument was made that the provision in the Canada Evidence Act, which excludes entirely from the court's jurisdiction the determination of uh, Crown public interest privilege in cabinet documents, whether that provision offended 
the core jurisdiction, the argument being made that control over the evidence, the determination of what evidence would be available and admissible was a matter going to the core jurisdiction of the court. That argument did not succeed when it reached the Court of Appeal. Uh, only one judge found it necessary to deal with it given the, the way it was disposed of, but basically rejected the idea that within the core jurisdiction included control over evidence. Another BC case, and I would say that the, the hotbed of uh, litigation in this area is definitely far to the west of, uh, of this city, but in another BC case dealing with the provincial legislation uh, to impose or to assist in the recovery of uh, health care costs against tobacco companies, uh, once again the invitation was made to apply the core jurisdiction test by the tobacco companies on whom a liability was imposed that would be determined by aggregated health information without any access to individual health information or any chance to challenge that evidence. And the court said, well, no, that can't be within the core jurisdiction either. But that core jurisdiction remains, and I would submit that it is certainly available and in play should a more vigorous limitation on uh, access to the courts be enacted. Let me deal in finally with the rule of law, and I must admit I'm somewhat hesitant to deal with this subject and to deal with uh, any of the, uh, the subjects of the unwritten, uh, uh, I would suggest possibly unknowable uh, principles of the Constitution. However, we do know that the rule of law is a constitutional principle. The Supreme Court of Canada has said it more than once. And did in the secession reference describe, at least in a general way, its content. You know, one law for all, a positive order of laws, uh, a regulation of the relationship uh, between the individual and the state by law. Uh, that much we know. What we don't know is whether the rule of law is an effective constitutional weapon. Is it a weapon which can be used not only to control the actions of government officials, quite possibly there, but can it be used against the legislative pronouncements of parliament and the provincial legislatures? Or putting it the other way, how does it fit with parliamentary supremacy? Now there may be some who will suggest, well, parliamentary supremacy is dead. Uh, my job as a, in the Department of Justice is to uh, give it as much uh, resuscitation as possible on a regular basis. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't get paid. <laughs> <clears throat> but parliamentary supremacy, I would suggest, is, is not dead, despite a passing comment in the secession reference. It is hemmed in, but once you get beyond, uh, beyond the charter, beyond the division of powers, there is room for Parliament to act. And examples of that in two cases. One is, in effect, a Pearson Airport type case. And that is Bacon and the Saskatchewan Crop Insurance Pro, uh, Corporation, a case from the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal. And that's as far as it's going. The Supreme Court of Canada uh, refused leave last week. In that case, the province had entered into, in effect, insurance contracts with farmers. It decided it needed to change the contracts. It had attempted to do that unilaterally. A court enjoined <coughs> that unilateral change. The legislature then dealt with the matter, enacted legislation changing the terms of the contract and quite expressly excluding any remedy for breach of contract. The farmers were not pleased. The farmers brought a challenge which left aside the charter and left aside the division of powers and invoked the rule of law, arguing that this was 
arbitrary, that it was creating a special law for the Crown, that was unacceptable. And the trial judge accepted the proposition that the legislation could be reviewed as to whether it accorded with the rule of law. And the review was basically one of, well, is this legislation arbitrary? My difficulty with that is that most legislation is arbitrary, involving fairly arbitrary choices. In the result, the trial judge found that the legislation wasn't arbitrary. When the matter reached the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal, they declined to get into questions of whether the legislation was arbitrary and answered quite bluntly that the rule of law cannot be used to strike down legislation. The rule of law means the rule of not only the common law, but of the statutory law. And once the province has changed the statutory law, what rules, in effect, is that statutory law? A fairly conventional analysis, but it is one which I think recognizes what the rule of law is about, and that is ensuring that government, the executive, abides by the law, but not limiting the power of the legislature to change the law. Those limitations can be found in the charter, they can be found in the division of powers. A second attempt to use the rule of law arose in another case dealing with this provision of the Canada Evidence Act, which limits, in effect, excludes the role of the court to a fair degree in the determination of whether cabinet confidences will be available as evidence. This arose out of the APEC inquiry, and the federal court had to deal with a question of whether that sort of legislation offended the rule of law, among other attacks, and approached it not so much on the basis that the rule of law couldn't be used as such to, as an unwritten principle wasn't effective to strike down legislation, and there's some suggestion that unwritten principles might be effective, and the reference with respect to provincial court judges' remuneration comes to mind there, but that the content of the rule of law does not mean that the common law is supreme. The rule of law accommodates legislative changes. It accommodates the removal of jurisdiction. Let me come back to my thesis, if I had one, and that is, with a number of these attacks, which basically have been unsuccessful, I don't think that will mean that people won't or shouldn't seek to pursue them, but looking at the rule of law analysis, looking at the core jurisdiction analysis, and the division of powers analysis, what I find worrisome is not so much the subjection of the legislative choices to judicial scrutiny, but the all or nothing nature of it, that the access to the courts will trump on the theory that the rule of law protects access to the courts, or that the core jurisdiction of the section 96 courts will always trump the legislature. There's no balancing, and maybe it comes from being used now after 18 years to engaging in the balancing within the Charter of Rights that is becoming more difficult to accept that other constitutional doctrines don't allow that sort of balancing, don't allow some justification, possibly don't allow some justification for the legislative choices. Thank you. I'm next going to call on Morris Manning, and what we're going to do is try to finish a few minutes early so that there can be questions, if people have questions. Now, Morris graduated from the University of Toronto Law School in 1965 and articled with the Department of the Attorney General before being called to the bar in 1967. 
Morris then began his career in the Criminal Appeals and Special Prosecutions Branch of the Attorney General's Department. In 1973, he was appointed Senior Crown Counsel, Civil Litigation, Constitutional Law at the branch of the Attorney General's Office. Today, Morris is in private practice, and in addition to his busy litigation schedule, Morris is a prolific writer in the area of criminal and constitutional law. In addition to his various texts and numerous articles, Morris also lectures extensively around the world. So with that introduction, I would like to call on Morris, as I'm sure we will both be educated and entertained with his, with his talk. <coughs> This is um, a great honor for me. It's the third time I've been asked to address the special lectures of the Law Society. Uh, the other two times dealt with abuse of power by Crown attorneys, in which all the Crown attorneys that I spoke to said, what power do we have? How can we ever be thought to abuse it? As well, I addressed the lectures on constitutional and statutory created torts in which someone came up to me after the lecture and said, you're a criminal lawyer, you don't know anything about torts, how can you write on it? <laughs> this time I've been asked to deal with the division of powers and section 9127, except I was a bit blindsided by my eagerness to be part of this honored tradition. Paul Shabas phoned me up and said, uh, we're putting together lectures for the special uh, lectures for the Law Society of Upper Canada, would you be willing to participate? I said, of course, uh, stupidly saying, of course, before finding out what the topic was, naturally thinking that it would be in some area where I had been practicing for the last uh, number of years, namely the Charter of Rights. Oh no, he said, it, it's in the area of criminal law and division of powers. And we would like you to review a couple of cases you know, RJR McDonald, uh, Hydro Quebec, and maybe the firearms reference, which is now before the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, I said, sure. I mean, after all, I hadn't paid much attention to those cases, uh, certainly knew what they stood for, had no idea that they were 600 pages in length. <laughs> uh, and so what I'd really like you to do is when you're doing the evaluations, uh, put me down as being non-entertaining and completely uninformative <laughs> so I won't get into this situation again. <laughs> I agree with uh, Neil that the division of powers is extremely important. Um, it is not a relic. It is not esoteric as uh, a reading of those cases that I've discussed in my paper will reveal. Uh, it is not as sexy as the Charter, but it is more important, I think, because particularly since the Supreme Court of Canada has extended the power of the federal government to criminalize conduct which uh, we wouldn't have thought of as being criminal and to brand people as criminals whom we would never have thought to be branded as criminals, it becomes really important to try to understand what they've said. Uh, we can't fathom why they've said it. I have to agree with people like Patrick Monaghan and uh, David Beattie, and I've made references uh, to both of them uh, in the materials. But it's important to note that in this area, it's not esoteric because the court takes us in a direction that no one ever thought it would go in. It has taken the, what we thought was a pretty straightforward test as to whether legislation would be upheld as being properly founded in 9127 and has undercut it and broadened the test. Many years ago, in order to protect the Quebec dairy farmers, although they didn't say that, the uh, Parliament of Canada passed legislation prohibiting the manufacture, possession, distribution of margarine. Uh, subsequently, uh, 
uh, under a lot of pressure from margarine manufacturers, uh, a reference was finally put before the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, as many of you in this room know, and particularly those who are with the public service and who have assisted in drafting of references, uh, the dice uh, were loaded, to continue with the analogy from this morning. Um, it was shown through studies that margarine didn't kill people. Of course, that was then. It's now uh, we have a different uh, <laughs> issue. Um, and and uh, it depends on uh, whether we're looking at the paper today or tomorrow as to whether butter or margarine is better or worse. <laughs> but it was claimed that because it was no longer a danger to health, there was no longer a need for the federal government to have control of the field, so to speak. And because it looked like it was controlling intra-provincial trade or agriculture in the province, the Supreme Court of Canada, not surprisingly, said it shouldn't be, uh, it, the legislation should be declared to be ultra-virus. Now, subsequent cases build on that, and they build on it in a way which no one had ever anticipated. We live, of course, in a divided jurisdiction state, and the division of powers is the quintessential area for political gain or loss. We also have to understand that what is at stake here is the government ability to control and to control various aspects of our lives. Each level of government blames the other for not doing things. We see examples of that uh, today, yesterday, and last week. We'll see examples in the very near future and the far future, where each level of government says, why doesn't the other level of government act in an area where the one level of government knows it can't act, and it's very safe because it then panders to the public. The decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada in the last five years, uh, as I've pointed out in the paper, have brought to the forefront the analysis by the late Albert Abel where he described the criminal law power as the floodplain clause which has enabled the Dominion Parliament to engulf whatever it will. Twenty years ago, more than twenty years ago, Alan Mewitt and I were uh, preparing the first edition of Mute and Manning on criminal law. And we pointed out in that text, uh, which was published in 78, uh, that an understanding of what criminal law is and what sources it's found in were questions which could be answered. What could not be readily answered was what conduct was to be part of the criminal law. And that's really what the Supreme Court of Canada has uh, brought itself to in the recent case law. It has decided what conduct should or should not be part of the criminal law, not only for purposes of division of powers, but for purposes of uh, upholding legislation which brands people criminals, <coughs> which allows their prosecution whether it be in a regulatory form or a prohibitory form. We, at that time, you and I, left open the question of what had been the distinction between civil and criminal law and remedies, and we questioned whether that rigid separation would ever be maintained. The answer posed by the Supreme Court of Canada in the last five years is, the distinction is no longer maintained and is indeed quite blurred. Let me give you a very short discussion, statement, if you will, of what I see in these cases. To be validly within section 9127, the old law held that the form had to be in a criminal law form. It had to be a prohibition enacted with a penalty. And secondly, there had to be 
what the courts called an underlying criminal purpose. Overlaid on top of that were the principles that Parliament could say what is or what is not criminal. And it could do that by exceptions and dispensations. Yet again, overlaid on top of that, Parliament was said to be able to prevent crime as well as to enact prohibitions to wipe it out. That's the state of the law until along comes RJR MacDonald and a few years later Hydro-Quebec. Now the law says, as I understand it, there does not have to be a criminal law form. We can found criminal law validly in 9127, even if it's in a purely regulatory form, there need not be any longer prohibitions with penalties as the form. And as far as the purpose is concerned, the purpose must be directed to an evil or injurious effect, an evil to be wiped out or an injurious effect to be avoided. And what is viewed as a traditional criminal purpose need not be paid attention to. We can do it solely by exception or dispensation and we can do it solely to prevent as opposed to cure. Now when you have an, a situation where you're going to apply this, and, and I'll take you to some uh, crystal ball gazing to some degree, it becomes apparent that this is a very highly subjective approach taken by the Supreme Court the overlay of tests upon tests and the undercutting and severing off of what used to be the requirement has left the federal government with a very powerful piece of artillery in which they can come in where the provincial government either can't come in because of lack of resources or chooses not to go in because of lack of political will. Dealing with the tests, and we all as practicing lawyers love to have our tests because how else are we then going to stand up in court and say we're right, we meet this test. The other side says we meet this other test. So let's take a look at what the tests are. How do you know from the time of the Privy Council, they said, well, you, you can't divine it by intuition. You can't divine whether something is properly criminal law by intuition. There is only one standard. Is it conduct prohibited with penalties? Well, that can't be the standard today because you can have a piece of legislation, uh, as was the case with Hydro-Quebec, where you had a ministerial permit situation you didn't have it in prohibitory form. You had it in regulatory form. You had it in a discretionary form in the hands of the minister. And the Supreme Court said, that's OK, at least the majority. The underlying criminal purpose, for example, need not necessarily be found, so long as it's a general injurious uh, purpose that you want to control. If you want to control an evil, that's OK. Uh, in what I viewed, and I'm sure most of you would view as uh, heresy, uh, they didn't follow, probably for the first and only time in uh, that millennium and in the next one, Peter Hogg's view <laughs> of whether or not you needed the underlying criminal purpose. The minority did in Hydro-Quebec, but not the majority. Taking the lead from the Privy Council, however, and keeping that lead, the Supreme Court of Canada has never dealt with the hard issue, namely, what conduct should be criminal. Notwithstanding the uh, <clears throat> passage of the Charter of Rights and the uh, sibboleth of uh, charter values in form of the common law, 
and some recent case law saying that charter values, of course, can also inform divisions of power cases and division of power law. Uh, the Supreme Court of Canada has never really uh, taken hold and gone into the hard question of what conduct should be criminal. Instead, they go back and they repeat the uh, format. It's necessarily an expanding field. It's plenary. It's a crime is an act which the law with appropriate penal sanctions forbids. The margin reference, but as prohibitions are not enacted in a vacuum, we can properly look for some evil or injurious or undesirable effect upon the public against which the law <coughs> pardon me, is directed. That effect may be in relation, and this is where the danger lies. That effect may be in relation to social, economic, or political interests. And the legislature has in mind to suppress the evil or to safeguard the interests threatened. Is the prohibition enacted with a view to a public purpose which can support it as being in relation to criminal law? Public peace, order, security, health, morality, these are the ordinary, though not exclusive ends, served by that law. That's a pretty wide-ranging test. And the question then arises as to whether there's any limitation on the power of the federal government to pass law and then ground it in 9127. The approach of the Supreme Court of Canada as a result of Hydro-Quebec and RJR MacDonald has been to say, as I've indicated, if it's regulatory, it's okay. If it's preventative, it's okay. If it's the underlying purpose is sort of broad and general, as Patrick Monaghan points out, uh, by defining broad and general in such a wide range, li liberal and flexible way, almost any conduct can be considered to be ripe for criminalization, if you will, and whether it goes into the provincial sphere of influence won't matter. We can see that both cases represent the giving of an open-ended and sweeping power. We can also see that when you look at the cases in detail, the search for a proper definition eludes one. They repeat all the tests and they reformat all the tests. Uh, it, it really is time, uh, I think, in the constitutional field, particularly charter and division of powers, for the Supreme Court of Canada to finally agree on a format for some of these tests because as we see with the Section 1 uh, situation and with the Section 15, as was addressed this morning, it becomes highly problematic, not only for those of us engaged in the exercise, almost academic exercise of arguing cases before the court, but in the very real practical exercise of advising clients. How do you advise uh, individuals uh, that their conduct may be viewed as being embedded in the criminal law power when they don't feel like criminals, they don't look like criminals, and they certainly don't think they act like criminals. Uh, indeed, the stigmatization uh, is apparent on the front of uh, today, one of today's papers where you have the tobacco executives sitting there uh, with a shot, uh, in effect, uh, almost labeled doctors of death. Now, it's true tobacco kills, and it's also true that Parliament has seen fit not to prohibit the sale of tobacco. And so in RJR MacDonald, the Supreme Court of Canada said it's quite all right because of the fact that so many Canadians are addicted to tobacco that Parliament choose not to prohibit it, but choose to circumvent the process and go at it in an indirect way by prohibiting advertising and by forcing the packages to have uh, little symbols of death on them. Uh, legislating for prevention rather than cure, doing it indirectly, and doing it in a form which isn't exactly prohibitory was viewed as being okay. So all of a sudden, advertising, freedom of speech, uh, notwithstanding, and the court struck 
the provisions as being an infringement of freedom of speech. And one would have thought that if that was so, in RJR McDonald, they would have then said, well, charter values inform the division of powers values. And therefore, if it's contrary to the Constitution in one part of the Constitution, it should be contrary to the Constitution in the other, particularly where you're looking at prohibiting conduct. They, of course, don't address that. Where does RJR MacDonald leave us? This is what I think. Where there is before the court evidence of social problems which Parliament seeks to resolve, which Parliament says are complex and which require innovative legislative solutions to address them effectively, Parliament can expect to have its legislation upheld under the criminal law power. If there's a problem in relation to social, economic, or political interests, which require a prohibition enacted with a view to suppressing an evil, which threatens an area of public peace, order, security, health, or morality, Parliament's legislation will be upheld, and it doesn't matter whether it's done in an indirect way. And it's important for us to know that where scientific knowledge, and this is where we're going in the future, where scientific knowledge evolves or has radically altered the social and political landscape, and there appears to be a growing national or international consensus that certain activities are sui juris problems that can only be addressed properly within the criminal law sphere, the legislation will be upheld. That finding, which I take out of the RJR McDonald case, is taken even further in the Hydro-Quebec case, where splitting off from the du dual limitation, uh, the Supreme Court of Canada, in effect, says, we don't have to pay a lot of attention to the underlying problem. Again. We don't have to pay any attention to the form because it's purely regulatory. Hydro-Quebec was dumping PCBs into the Maurice River in 1990. And by the time the case gets to the Supreme Court of Canada, environment, which is an amorphous subject such as health, uh, is ripe for legislation. The legislation is not in prohibitory form. It doesn't appear on its face to have that criminal law aspect. The majority says, well, that's OK. It's still valid, and it's still valid in the criminal law sphere. One thing as practicing lawyers that disturbed me when I read that case, and I'm sure it will disturb a lot of us, is that the court heard a lot of argument on the national concern doctrine. Briefs were put in, extensive briefs. There was a parade of uh, superstar lawyers, as is usual in constitutional cases. Uh, and in the result, the court heard extensive argument and read extensive argument on the national concern doctrine. The majority, however, say, well, you know, you guys got it wrong. All these uh, men and women who argued before us, well, uh, you all dealt with the national concern doctrine, whereas we really should be focusing on the criminal law power. And it's one thing for the Supreme Court of Canada during oral argument to say to counsel, uh, Mr. Manning, um, we don't want to hear you on the national concern doctrine. We're really interested in criminal law. And even though you're, you'd like to spend uh, your hour dealing with national concern, we want you to spend it on criminal law. That's one thing. It's another, when they go back into the uh, rarefied atmosphere of the Supreme Court chambers, and sit down and they say, well, we're taking this in a slightly di different direction than what counsel have brought it to us. That the direction that they want us to go in deals with national concern, we're not gonna deal with that and they in effect have it wrong. And I invite you to, to look at those passages and consider what the impact is as a practical matter uh, for styling your factums and uh, presenting uh, your brief oral argument. The only qualification that seems to be on Parliament's plenary power over criminal law is that the power can't be employed colorably. Now, 
the last time that legislation was found to be colorable was probably before any of us were born. Um, but uh, one has to take as well the language of Hydro-Quebec, which allows an extension of the power to an almost uncontrollable degree. Let me read you a couple of passages to illustrate. The purpose of the criminal law is to underline and protect our fundamental values. One phrase. Second, the criminal law must be able to keep pace with and protect our emerging values. Criminal law seeks by discrete prohibitions to prevent evils falling within a broad purpose, such as, for example, the protection of health. In the criminal law area, reference to such policy objectives is simply a means of ensuring that the prohibition is legitimately aimed at some public evil and is not a colorable attempt to deal with the matter falling exclusively within provincial jurisdiction. Emerging values as opposed to set values. Professor David Beatty's analysis of Hydro-Quebec is, I feel, an excellent example of why those who do not appear on a regular basis in the Supreme Court of Canada or even on any basis can indulge themselves in exercising academic freedom. This is the kind of language he uses when describing Justice Laferay's both formal and substantive definition of the federal government's criminal law powers. And I read this and I had in mind an article I did on the Lyons case where I, I thought I went pretty far. Uh, uh, but somebody who wanted to go back to the Supreme Court of Canada without carrying too much baggage. Uh, whether we, I carry enough of it, uh, that's another story. But he says that like conjurers, he calls them conjurers, this is the Supreme Court of Canada. Laferay and his supporters, not his colleagues, not the other justices, <laughs> conjurers, like conjurers, Laferay and his supporters made the requirement that the criminal law be drafted in the form of a prohibition backed by a penalty just disappear into thin air. He goes on pretty well, but hyperbole aside, it's, it's difficult to not agree that Hydro-Quebec represents a radical change in the analysis and the extent and control of section 9127 the result that the form need no longer contain a broadly worded general ban, and the reach of underlying purpose, as uh, Patrick Monaghan points out, is so broad that I say it can reach into areas, and I point out some of them, again, it's an attempt to crystal ball it. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, I might get retained, and that would be nice. Uh, but into um, genetically altered foods, agriculture, uh, biotechnology, reproductive technologies, and regulation of the internet. The difficulty arises when you read a case like the firearms reference in the Alberta Court of Appeal. Pretty smart group, and a, a really a nice judgment by Chief Justice Fraser, particularly, and I agree with Dale Gibson's <clears throat> analysis that uh, her analysis of what is the quote matter quote, a subject that's been the matter of uh, academic debate since uh, I was in law school uh, more than 35 years ago in which uh, Bor Laskin and Dean Letterman exchanged uh, articles in the Canadian Bar Review, what is the matter? Uh, she goes through the analysis in a way that uh, is, as Dale Gibson puts it, uh, will be viewed as being the locus classicus of, of that area, area. But she attempts to apply the principles from the Supreme Court to what I thought was a pretty uh, easy case, the firearms reference, Bob Charney wouldn't agree, they, uh, Ontario took a, a I'm, I'm pregnant, not pregnant, halfway house uh, approach, uh, but Chief Justice Fraser attempts to apply the principles and states that in order to fall within Parliament's criminal law power, the impugned legislation must meet three requirements. It must include a prohibition, it must be backed by a penalty, and it must be directed to a legitimate public purpose. And you sit back and you say, no, wait a minute, I thought that 
it didn't need three anymore. But she says it needs three. The difficulty arises from the fact that she holds that any one of the three will provide the necessary foundation for the exercise of the federal criminal law power. And then she overlays on top of that four other considerations, one of which seeks to confine the reach of the federal criminal power, and the other three of which seem to extend it. She notes that all criminal law uh, attempts must be kept within tolerable limits, and the courts must be vigilant in placing some reasonable limit on the criminal law power. Why, we don't know, but that's what she says. But then she says, <coughs> excuse me, regulation, and in this field, the federal government need not use the criminal code, in other words, you don't have to put it in the form of criminal law, that the criminal law is not closed or static, but is dynamic, evolutionary, and responsive. And lastly, that the criminal law power is proactive as well as reactive, preventative as well as punitive. Now, where do we go with all this? Hopefully, the Supreme Court of Canada, which has heard argument in the firearms reference, will straighten it out. There's a totally new uh, set of uh, justices there, and uh, Justice Laffery isn't there to lead the charge on behalf of the regulatory society, neither is uh, Peter Corey. Uh, but, and as I pointed out, you know, they, they love to say how much we need regulation, and uh, maybe another law society uh, special lecture should be designed to the, meet the question of whether we need all this regulation, but that's another story. Future areas of concern, reproductive technology. Why did I pick that? I picked that because the uh, Royal Commission on New Reproductive Technologies, several years old now, made a recommendation that in order to protect these new technologies, uh, there should be regulation in the form of criminal law regulation. And, and I've pointed out that Patrick Healy and his analysis makes a very persuasive argument for why this ought not to be criminal law. Other areas, are areas where ever there appears to be order, security of the country as a whole. Consider a National Securities Act, something that's been talked about for years. We now have the opening of the NASDAQ exchange in Quebec. You have the Toronto Stock Exchange. You have the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Is it in the best interests of order and security and a failing Canadian dollar for the markets to be regulated by First of all, those stock exchanges, or should there be one? Is that possible? We don't know. But more importantly, what about a National Securities Act? Where you load it with regulatory matters, you put in regulatory form, but you also have certain penalties criminalizing conduct. The Securities and Exchange Commission of the United States uh, is almost as feared as the uh, the Drug Enforcement Agency, and probably more so because uh, it targets individuals who don't think of themselves as either being criminals or committing criminal acts. Yet the penalties, the prosecutions, uh, the way in which those matters are handled uh, are designed to replicate criminal law. Um, I've made reference to internet regulation, another area where there's no uh, large leap uh, from the regulation of telecommunications currently within the purview of the federal government. Uh, the models there to control electronic commerce. Will it matter whether the commerce is viewed as intra or interprovincial? I doubt it. Does it have to be in a criminal law model? Not today. Can it be just within the discretion of some uh, minister uh, doing it by permit as in the Hydro-Quebec case? Answer is, of course. Consider also regulation of agriculture. Interprovincial trade or intraprovincial trade. Supreme Court of Canada for the last uh, 50 years uh, has struggled with the issue and has finally put it out. Uh, it seems clear. Can the federal government go in uh, under the guise of health? 
Well, under the guise is a loaded term. It's an emotional term. Let's not call it under the guise. Can they go in to control genetic, genetically modified foods? Uh, leave aside the debate between Princess Anne and Prince Charles. Can we deal with health interests in the agriculture field by rooting it in the criminal law power? I think it's possible. I think the Supreme Court of Canada has given the federal government a very important addition to its constitutional arsenal. Thank you. The topic of my paper, and a paper that I've authored with Gord McKee, is constitutional considerations concerning national class actions. Now this topic probably just confirms in the minds of most of you in the room that you can't have a CLAE lecture today without having someone speak about class actions and what's going on. So we've got one here in a constitutional law set. As we note in the paper, one of the most important developments in the civil litigation field over the past five years has been the growth in class action litigation. Only three provinces to date, being Quebec, Ontario, and British Columbia, have passed class action legislation. But while that's the case, the courts in those provinces have showed a marked willingness to certify national classes. Orders of this type raise interesting constitutional questions concerning the limits on a provincial superior court's ability to certify a class that includes and binds individuals and corporations resident outside the province. This paper addresses two questions. The first is, what are the constitutional limits on the composition of a plaintiff's class under provincial class action legislation? And second, what ability does Parliament have to pass uniform class action legislation making the class action process available to all Canadians to address wrongs with a pan-Canadian impact. And if I could just summarize the conclusions reached in the paper with respect to those two questions. With respect to the first question concerning the composition of a plaintiff's class under provincial legislation, the Supreme Court of Canada in Morgard expanded the traditional limits of the court's jurisdiction over non-residents to extend to actions that have a real and substantial connection with the foreign province. But at the same time, the court also has confirmed that courts with an insufficient connection to the parties and the subject matter of the action have no jurisdiction. When reviewing the recent case law where national class actions have been certified, I take the view in the paper that the, courts have certified, that the courts which have certified national class actions to date have not been rigorous enough in their application of the Morgard principles in terms of their willingness to assert jurisdiction over non-residents. Based on Morgard, we are of the view that a provincial court cannot, under provincial class action legislation, certify a national class unless the claims of each member of the plaintiff's class has a real and substantial connection to the foreign province, not based on matters of convenience, but on the connections to the events and the parties at the time each cause of action arose. That's our summary with the first question. With respect, in, respect to the second issue concerning Parliament's jurisdiction to pass national class action legislation, some support for that statement can be found from the Supreme Court of Canada decision in Morgard. For the reasons that I will address in a couple of minutes, however, again, I'm of the view that such legislation is not supportable under Parliament's Section 91 powers. In short, what I'm saying is that in the abstract, there cannot be a federal code of civil procedure. And support for that proposition can be found in the wording of the Constitution Act itself, in that the drafters of the Constitution clearly knew to refer to procedure when that was their intention. Take, for example, Section 9127 of the Constitution Act, 
which refers to federal jurisdiction over criminal law, including procedure. Now you might wonder, well, is this really a problem in today's day and age, or is uh, Galway just talking more about a philosophical question? Well, let me pose the following hypothetical question. I don't think it's really a remote uh, scenario. Assume that a new medical procedure is developed in the United States for the treatment of heart disease. Given that this procedure is not yet available in Ontario, OHIP enters into an agreement with a particular clinic in the Buffalo area to administer the new procedure to Ontario residents. While other provinces refuse to fund this procedure, residents from all over Canada go to that Buffalo clinic for, for treatment. Unfortunately, it's subsequently discovered that the procedure has severe side effects and a class action is started in Ontario against the clinic by an Ontario resident on behalf of himself and on behalf of all Canadians who obtain treatment at the clinic. Now that hypothetical raises a number of questions. First, can the U.S. clinic, which carries on no business in Ontario, object to Canadian residents outside of Ontario being members of the Ontario plaintiff's class, given that their claims individually have no connection to Ontario? Does the mere fact that there may be common factual and legal issues give the Ontario court jurisdiction to certify a national class? For Canadian residents outside of Ontario who do not opt out of the class, can they enforce a favorable judgment against the U.S. clinic in jurisdictions outside of Ontario? And what if the U.S. clinic successfully defeats the Ontario class action? Does that judgment preclude a non-Ontario resident who is a member of the class from proceeding with an action in his or her home province? And finally, what happens if similar class actions are commenced in British Columbia and or Quebec with duplication of class members? Now, there are no clear answers to these questions. Uh, certainly, not, they're not found in the various Provincial Class Proceedings Act. Any analysis of the ability of a court to certify a national class must start with the territorial limitations on a province's legislative powers. In this regard, Section 92, 92A, 93, and 95 of the Constitution Act, each open with the words, in the province. In short, it's well established that these phrases in the Constitution Act do impose territorial limitations on provincial legislative powers. It's also clear, however, that the impairment of extra-provincial rights may in some cases be validly accomplished by provincial legislatures as an incidental effect of a statute that is in relation to a matter within the province. Now here clearly the pith and substance of the provincial class action legislation is in relation to matters which would fall within provincial legislative competence. The question for our purposes, however, is whether if there is extra provincial effect is it constitutionally permissible? And the recent case law of the Supreme Court of Canada concerning the ability of a provincial court to take jurisdictions over parties resident outside the province, as well as the recent case law concerning recognition of provincial court judgments obtained outside the province, support the notion that there are constitutional limitations on the composition of a plaintiff's class which extend beyond provincial boundaries. This case law is focused not on an analysis of incidental effect, but on whether there is a real and substantial connection to the province. And the leading case which establishes this real and substantial connection is Moorgard and de Savoy, a 1990 decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. Now, as you may recall, in that case, Morgard obtained a default judgment in Alberta against Mr. de Savoy on a mortgage of Alberta land for the difference between the value of the mortgage property and the amount owing under the mortgage. Morgard then brought an action in British Columbia, where Mr. de Savoy resided, to enforce the Alberta judgment. And the issue before the Supreme Court of Canada 
was whether the, whether the personal judgment validly given by an Alberta court against Mr. Disavoy could be enforced in British Columbia. Justice Lafore, writing for the court, noted that the BC court should enforce the Alberta judgment if Alberta properly exercised jurisdiction in the first place. The problem in the case, however, was that on traditional grounds, the Alberta court could not take jurisdiction as the defendant was not resident in Alberta at the time the action was commenced, nor had the defendant or torn to the jurisdiction. In his decision, Justice Lafoure acknowledged the need for expanded jurisdiction over provincial courts to facilitate the exchange of commerce within a federation like Canada. At the same time, however, he also recognized that there must be some limits on the exercise of jurisdiction against persons outside the province. Justice Lafoure held that this balance was achieved where there was a real and substantial connection between the forum province and the action. And Justice Lafoure went on to talk about the competing interests that were at play here. On the one hand, he referred to principles of order, which militated in favor of the security of transactions. What's he talking about? What he's really saying is that a person shouldn't be able to avoid their obligations by simply leaving the jurisdiction. But the second factor to be balanced is that of fairness, fairness to the defendant, in that a defendant should not be the subject of suit in any jurisdiction without regard to the contacts that jurisdiction has to the defendant for the subject matter of the claim. Justice Lafoure was of the view that the real and substantial connection test provided a reasonable balance between these competing factors. Now, to apply the principles in, in, in Morgard to provincial class actions, and specifically the ability of a court to certify a national class, it's first necessary to determine what the Supreme Court of Canada meant when it referred to the need for a real and substantial connection with the foreign province. The confusion arises due, the, due to the fact that in Morgard, in addition to referring to the need to demonstrate a real and substantial connection between the party and the foreign province, the court was sloppy in its language because in other parts of the judgment it goes on and talks about the real and substantial connection with the action, the damages suffered, the subject matter of the suit. So what is Morgard about? In my view, at a minimum, Morgard is about jurisdiction of the court over the person of the defendant. The real and substantial connection test propounded in Morgard was, like the traditionally accepted grounds of resonance and voluntary submission, to determine whether the court had jurisdiction over the defendant, not some new subject matter jurisdiction. And what this suggests is that the court's jurisdiction in class actions must still focus on the connections between the form province and the individual parties and subject matter of each of their claims, rather than on the subject matter of the class action as a whole. Now let me move forward to some of the uh, Ontario, primarily the Ontario decisions that have certified national classes. They're discussed extensively in the paper. And then what you will see is that in many instances, such classes have been certified with little or no discussion of the constitutional issues raised. Where the constitutional issues are raised, the courts have tended to focus incorrectly in my view, on the existence of the common issue in the litigation as constituting the real and substantial connection between the form province and the subject matter of the litigation. In this regard, it's my position that the focus should be on the connections between the parties and the events at the time the cause of action arose, not the common issue. In terms of the requirements of order and fairness, the courts have incorrectly, again in my view, relied upon a perceived need to deal with national classes and the perceived desirability of litigating these problems in one court. And just to try to give you a flavor of what's motivating the courts in certifying these classes, 
I set out a quote in the paper from Justice Brockenshire's decision in Webb and Kamer. Now in that case, the representative plaintiff was a former employee of Kmart who had been terminated subsequent to the acquisition of Kmart by Hudson's Bay Company. And the plaintiff proposed to certify a class of former Kmart employees across Canada who during a certain time period worked for Kmart. And in certifying the national class, Justice Brockenshire had the following to say. Obviously, from the points of view of both the national corporation and its employees across the nation, there should not be disparities in treatment arising solely from an accident of geography. The lack of comparable class action legislation elsewhere in Canada, except for British Columbia and Quebec, is a telling argument for extending the reach of the Ontario legislation. We must somehow, as Professor Sanders says, fit the form to the fuss. Well, with all due respect to Justice Brockenshire, as I note in the paper, the desirability of including non-residents in a class action who might otherwise be treated differently by the courts in some other province surely cannot override the territorial limitations in Section 92 of the Constitution Act and the constitutional principles laid down in Morgard. So as such, to just finish up on this first issue, it's my position that where the traditional rules concerning when a court can take jurisdiction do not apply, the court should refuse to certify a national class action unless it has been established that the subject matter of the claims asserted by each of the persons in the plaintiff's class, focusing on the connections between the provinces, province and the events and the parties at the time the cause of action arose, have a real and substantial connection with the foreign province. Failing that, the courts will have no jurisdiction over the parties with respect to the person's claim, neither notice, a right to opt out, nor the extension of a common issue alone, or existence of a common issue alone, is sufficient to establish the real and substantial connection needed. Now, we only have a few minutes left, so I just want to take two or three minutes and talk about Parliament's jurisdiction. For the reasons that I've just briefly reviewed, it's clear that there are some limitations on the ability of a court interpreting a provincial class action statute to certify a national class. And to the extent these limitations exist, a question arises as to whether Parliament might have the constitutional authority to pass national class action legislation to deal with causes of action where members in the proposed class reside in two or more provinces. The obvious advantage to this type of federal legislation is that it would avoid the territorial restrictions faced by judges in interpreting provincial class action legislation. The obvious concern with that type of legislation is the significant intrusion that would result in areas that fall predominantly within provincial legislation or jurisdiction. As Professor Hogg notes in his text on constitutional law, it's clear that Parliament has no independent power to create civil remedies akin to its power over criminal law. The creation and regulation of civil actions as a general rule falls within the provincial legislative jurisdiction under 92.13 and 92.14. Uh, An exception to this rule has been carved out, however, for situations where Parliament is entitled to legislate with respect to civil liability, either as part of its core jurisdiction in relation to a matter coming within a federal head of power, or where civil liability provisions are functionally connected to valid federal legislation. So in this paper, what we've done is look to see whether there's any valid federal head of power that could support federal class action legislation. And we look at the peace order and good government power and the trade and commerce power. And dealing very briefly with the peace order and good government power, in Crown Zellerback, Justice Ledane noted that for a matter to qualify as a national concern, it had to have the singleness, distinctiveness, and indivisibility, which clearly distinguishes it from matters of provincial concern. And second, it must be shown in effect that it is beyond the power of the provinces to deal with the matter. Now in this case, it's difficult to see 
how the federal class action legislation could be found to have the singleness, distinctiveness, and indivisibility required to constitute a national concern. In this regard, the Supreme Court of Canada has said at various times that inflation, for example, was not distinct enough to qualify as a matter, to constitute a national concern. That's the majority in the anti-inflation reference. The Supreme Court has said in another case that health is, quote, another amorphous topic. It's gone on to state in the city national leasing case that competition is not a single matter any more than inflation or pollution. And in the recent firearms case, certain members of the Alberta Court of Appeal stated that firearm registration would not constitute a single distinct and indivisible subject matter. Any federal legislation with respect to national class actions would be a very significant intrusion over the jurisdiction of the provinces with respect to property and civil rights. In effect, Parliament would be imposing a dispute resolution mechanism on provinces that may well have consciously decided not to pass provincial class action legislation. Moreover, I don't think it can be said to be on the power of the courts to, to deal with national classes, although their scope may be more limited than that permitted by the courts today. In any event, I think that's addressed quite clearly by Peter Hogg when he talks about, when he says the following, uniformity is desirable with respect to many topics and for many reasons. But of course, the distribution of legislative powers in a federal system necessarily involves a substantial subordination of the value of uniformity to that of provincial autonomy, even where there is no object necessity for regional variations. Now in the paper I cover the trade and commerce power, I'll just skip over that. You can take a look at that if you're interested. Just to clue up, as noted by Justice Ledane in Crown Zellerback, it is a mistake to assume that there must be plenary jurisdiction in one order of government or the other to deal with any legislative problem. In this case, while there may be limits on a court's ability to certify a national class under provincial class action legislation, that is a product of our constitutional system. In my view, any attempt by Parliament to deal with the perceived problems or limitations with the provincial class action statutes in terms of the ability to certify a national class would constitute a radical departure from our present system of federalism. Thank you very much. It's now the lunch break. What we're going to do, as I understand, is uh, lunch will be extended for 15 minutes this afternoon. So we're happy, I think, to stay here and answer any questions that you have for five minutes. Uh, we can do that. And uh, yes. I have a question for Morris Manning uh, on the division of powers in the law now. The uh, federal government uh, seems to be having, trying to have, have a cake and eat it too. It's, it's uh, trying to assert the criminal law power in the Canadian and John and the fact that Quebec and Jason and Mary might not be so obvious. And um, in the past, they should be prosecuted. Now, trying to avoid uh, Section 8 problems. I think one of the problems you run into with uh, that situation is that uh, uh, income tax is exclusively uh, within the uh, federal sphere and you get into the um, 
the area of uh, Parliament being able to enforce its own taxing statutes by whatever means it seems fit uh, or sees fit to do. You get into special procedures to enforce uh, criminal law, uh, the CN transportation case uh, situation. So I don't think there's a lot of room for uh, crossover there. Yes. Glad to get the correct pronunciation of the uh, of the, the plaintiff's name. Um, I think the analysis of a, of the court is lacking because it, the the analysis, as I see it, is basically saying, well, the balancing is okay if the if the court has the freedom to do it as the court of competent jurisdiction, and that's how I understand what they what they say with respect to the latches argument. Well, it's okay to limit by time if the court's doing it. But the rest of the uh, rights and protections in the Charter can be limited, subject to judicial scrutiny, definitely, and meeting of tests or whatever, uh, by the legislature. And I have a difficulty conceptually accepting that uh, the legislature cannot also attempt to limit the remedies and then have that limitation scrutinized. If that's it, anyone, anyone else want to ask a question before we break? Thank you very much. We'll see you back here after lunch.